He was one of the most highly opinionated characters in all of music, someone who would decry radicals for not being quite radical enough for his taste, and who proved a central figure in both serial and electroacoustic music. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Pierre Boulez. Pierre Boulez was born in March 1925 in central France to an upper middle class family and was named after his older brother who had died in infancy. His father was an engineer and by many accounts was a fairly dictatorial character within the family. Young Pierre was sent off to Catholic school which drove him away from the faith, but he inherited a predilection for mathematics and engineering from his father, and so after high school he was sent off to the University of Lyon. Boulez's plan was to use Lyon as a springboard to go to the best engineering school in Paris, but those plans were put on hold when the Germans invaded, so he switched to another one of his lifelong loves that of music. He'd played the piano as a kid and even in some amateur chamber groups, but he hadn't heard an opera or a symphony orchestra performance until he was in Lyon, and later on he would say that the German invasion brought high culture to France. The problem was that his father was not happy with music as a career choice, and the Lyon Conservatoire also rejected his application, but Boulez was undaunted and alongside his siblings managed to convince his father to let him move to Paris and pursue private study there. His first attempt at getting into one of the Paris Conservatoire's classes ended also in failure. He didn't get into the class he wanted to get in, but he managed to get into a harmony class, and from there, that allowed him to get into a more advanced harmony class taught by Olivia Massian. This proved to be something of a gateway drug to new music, and Boulez's enthusiasm for modernism was of a polemical nature. He boycotted his fugue class, for instance, because he just didn't like the professor. He also broke off private lessons with the Schoenberg disciple René Leibovitz. When Leibovitz was, he felt too critical of his first piano sonata, daring to take a red pen to one of Boulez's drafts. Although it was Leibovitz who first introduced Boulez to Webern's music in 1945, beginning with the Opus 21 symphony, Boulez soon saw in his teacher a dogmatic adherence to Schoenberg. When a publisher later inquired as to whether or not the first sonata should retain its dedication to Leibovitz, Boulez got so mad that he shredded the manuscript with a letter opener. He could be as critical of his elders all he wanted, but that didn't mean he had a musical career, or even a job. He didn't even have much of a place to stay. He was living in an attic, and that was only subsidized because he tutored his landlord's son in math. He performed in pit orchestras and on the radio, primarily on an early electronic instrument known as the Andmatten. No. He got another lucky break soon, though, as Jean-Louis Barreau and his wife, Madeleine Renault, both actors by training, started a theater troupe and hired their sharp on de Montano player as music director in 1946. Boulez was at first a fan of the on de Montano, being on the cutting edge of electronic sound production and capable of effortless glissandi, unlike the very difficult to control theremin. Later in life, he would express a deep dislike of the instrument, and I think this was because electronic music had advanced so much that the relatively simple sound of the On de Montenot just didn't do it for him anymore. He absolutely hated the kind of music that this theater troupe played, the Tchaikovsky's and the Offenbach's of the world, but he had a lot of free time because he could learn scores quickly, and so he could compose pieces how he saw fit, not having to make any money off of their publication or performances. He was free to experiment in a totally radical new direction, Direction. And from the beginning of his first published piece, a flute sonatina from 1946, we see a highly individual style, because Boulez was not a composer who took a few opus numbers to figure out who he was. To understand the direction of Boulez's music, we have to back up a bit. For young European modernists of Boulez's time, the 12-tone technique of Arnold Schoenberg, as refined by Anton Webern, was the key to unlocking an entirely new musical paradigm, and Webern's accidental murder at the end of World War II at the hands of a trigger-happy American GI left a hole in European musical culture. Webern, whose works were already treasured by a select portion of the European avant-garde, was now something of a martyr figure. With the fall of Nazism, the floodgates opened, and now Europe was awash in music that the Nazis had repressed because they called it degenerate. Boulez and his contemporaries latched onto Webern's ideas and pulled them in a new direction, particularly the concept that the 12-tone technique, the series of rows and sets and series, could be applied to musical parameters that weren't just pitch. By applying the principle of tone rows and sets to durations, articulations, dynamics, etc., 
serialism was born, with Boulez at its heart. Schoenberg was dead, Boulez claimed in an essay of the same name, and we're going to get to why in just a minute. This was a rational, calculating, and most importantly, entirely new form of musical expression. For many in France, the horrors of both world wars had destroyed romanticism, any hopes that the human race might have of bettering itself. The world needed a music that was as cold and as harsh as the world that birthed it. By the second piano sonata of the late 40s, Boulez stated his intention of destroying classical forms, saying that it was the second Viennese school's fascination with past forms that grated on his nerves so much that he had to destroy the one thing that they didn't destroy. But how does one destroy sonata form? Instead of concatenating melodic and rhythmic snippets and possibilities into the form of a theme which could then be developed and contrasted in the classical style, Boulez worked with small rhythmic cells and slowly dissolved them into the texture. For Boulez and a lot of the rest of his avant-garde compatriots, rhythm was now as important, if not more important, than pitch. This is exactly what John Cage was doing in his Sonatas and Interludes for Prepared Piano, which is contemporaneous with Boulez's second sonata. Ironically, Beethoven was one of Boulez's influences in this period because Beethoven took a hammer to classical notions of what the sonata was and could be, revolutionizing it more than any composer had before or since. Boulez said that modern music should restore its lost spirit of irreverence. The composers of the past he admired, he said, did not blindly follow tradition. They grabbed tradition and forced it to follow them. While Boulez did not invent serialism, no one composer can be credited with that, Webern included, his assuredness and self-confidence, moving boldly where others were more timid, made him a natural leader. While composers like Messiaen were experimenting in rhythmic series, which applied the 12 tone technique to note durations, Boulez staked his claim at the far end of serialism, total or integral serialism, where all aspects of a piece were serialized before the composition began. The result of total serialism was that there was no hope for a traditional musical line or continuity to be preserved. Once you set up your sets and your rows, you let them play out in the piece, and really all the compositional work was in the pre-compositional work. Total serialism took all the composition out of composition. Boulez had bold and innovative ideas about serial music, but wasn't nearly as set in his ways in these early years as he would come to be rather infamous for, and so he was interested in all the other directions of avant-garde music that were essentially capturing the same goal that he was after. After all, there were similar innovations along this line that pursued atonality and the systematic negation of what the West considered to be well, like traditional music. Karlheinz Stockhausen and John Cage were very different composers, and both of them different from Boulez, but Boulez founded them kindred radical spirits. It was Cage who helped Boulez find publishers for his first two piano sonatas, and it was Boulez who first brought up chance in his correspondence with Cage through the late 40s and early 50s. By the mid-1950s, Boulez's opinions on music were calcifying, to the point where he dumped Cage as a friend because Cage started relying more and more on chance operations to determine the parameters of his music. For Boulez, the concept of not having control, extreme control in some cases, over every aspect of his completed compositions was antithetical to his prevailing ideology, although it wasn't without a fight. In his third piano sonata, he attempts to to corral chance procedures and aleatoric devices, letting the performer choose the direction through the pieces and what they're going to play with his extreme sense of rigor. It seems fair to say that in his mature years, Boulez had a circumscribed view of what chance procedures could and should be, and his third sonata is his attempt to square chance procedures with the serial music that became his hallmark. The third sonata 
palette is chock full of performer's choices when it comes to the ordering of sections within a movement, which he calls formants in the course of the piece, as well as the ordering of the formants themselves within the larger scope of the work. The issue with open form pieces like this, as Stockhausen and the American composer Earl Brown ran into, is that you have to be okay, as the composer, with every possible permutation of the piece, including choices that you wouldn't make if you were given the chance to perform the piece yourself. But even Boulez could not manage to write an aleatoric piece that lived up to his very high standards of satisfaction. And it's telling that only half of the piece has ever been published. Much as Boulez had dumped Cage as a friend in the early 1950s, Boulez dumped Stockhausen as a friend in the late 1950s, perhaps because Boulez thought he'd been undercut. He had been exchanging ideas with Stockhausen about indeterminacy and aleatoric form throughout the 1950s, and he felt like he'd been beaten to the punch when Stockhausen published his 11th Klavierstück in 1956. Boulez's friendship with Stravinsky, once lively, also cooled. Stravinsky, for Boulez and his friends, wasn't radical enough, so they booed pieces that they thought didn't go far enough in the direction of the avant-garde, despite Stravinsky writing serial music at the time. He started, with the help of some wealthy patrons, a concert series known as Le Domaine Musical, which focused on new music from both before and after the war. It's important to note that Boulez was as important as a conductor as he was as a composer, partially because his compositions were so big and complex that it took a long time for him to craft one. His music was one of incredible precision and calculation, well in line with most serialist views that music should be considered more of a scientific discipline than as a public medium of artistic expression. With this in mind, we can understand Boulez's boldest example of total serialism, Structures 1A. The premiere of this piece, with Boulez on one piano and Messian on the other, was, according to Ben Parsons' article Sets in the City, link in the description, the stuff of conspiracy theory. The CIA and its anti-communist zeal poured money into promotion of the arts, especially in France, because they felt like they had a chance of swinging the left-leaning Parisian intellectuals over to a pro-American sentiment by contrasting the American love for art of all kinds to the socialist realist doctrine, which was essentially whatever the USSR liked. The premiere featured, according to several different accounts, a ruckus in the audience and one guy getting dragged out by the police. Even Boulez understood that his piece was going to be difficult on the ears, advising pianist David Tudor to have some aspirin ready when he co-performed the piece in New York, along with Boulez. Boulez didn't consider this piece a failure because it was difficult on the ears. He considered it a failure because serialism did not generate form in the way he'd expected it to. But he learned something from the process. Soon, his search for form and structure was informed by his exploration of poetry by the symbolist Stéphane Mallarmé, who prized unusual word order as well as the sound of words over their meanings, as well as the surrealist hermeticist René Char. He also found inspiration in the stream of consciousness style of Irish novelist James Joyce, and it was Cage who first gave him a copy of Finnegan's Wake. While he still loved poetry and explored the relationship between poetry and music both in his compositions and his writings, he largely abandoned writing for voice as his career progressed. Eventually he moved beyond the need to rely on a poem structure as a crutch for his music structure. He solved this dilemma through something that he called indiscipline which allowed for complex control at the micro level and broader forms at the macro level. His ideal music was organically generated from various interconnected facets, which would guarantee a kind of formal unity to the piece as it grew. He also loved recycling material between pieces because his serial techniques allowed for pretty much endless derivation of new sets from old sets, and he didn't feel like he was really done with a set until he'd done all that he could with it, which often took multiple pieces. For Boulez, serial music wasn't just a technique in music. For him, it was a philosophy close to being a full-on way of life. He furiously castigated any musician who dared write non-12-tone music, calling the technique necessary, and saying that any composer who hadn't taken that technique into their language was useless. He was bold, he was confrontational, he was willing to court controversy, and if he didn't like you, he could be downright vicious. All art of the past, Boulez said, needed to be destroyed. 
He rejected a linear conceptualization of history, musical or otherwise. If you were a composer who lived after the invention of serial techniques and you didn't latch on to where music was going, you were just flotsam on the sea of music to him. For him, the choice was between a museum culture, which still permeates most of classical music, and a total abnegation of it. You couldn't respect the past and not be totally drawn into it. In order to focus on the here and now, you had to kill the past. He blamed this for the lack of innovation in musical instruments in the classical world vis-a-vis -vis the pop world, because the pop world for Boulez didn't have nearly the same kind of museum culture and reverence for history as the classical world did, and so the market provided new and better instruments every single generation. By inventing the need for new instruments, contemporary composers could spur on the development of new instruments that would fit their conceptualizations. This fusing of music and science led him to an early flirtation with microtones. He used quarter tones in an early version of his cantata Le Visage Nuptial only to remove them when he edited this piece in the 1980s. Boulez was well aware that giving over every compositional parameter to serialism would be the death knell of the composer's role in the compositional process, but he was still staunch in his insistence that serialism was the way forward. He was constantly threading the needle between navigating the inherent restrictions of his chosen system and wanting to be expressive within those confines. He achieved this precisely because of how he conceptualized serial technique, in a way that was totally different from Schoenberg and the Second Viennese School, whereas Schoenberg and his crowd would assemble 12-note tone rows, which would essentially be atonal substitutions for tonal themes, which could then be developed and articulated in every single way that would be analogous in the classical form. Because Schoenberg was so fond of the past, he considered himself to be an extension of that past tradition. Boulez, wanting to blow all of it up, saying Schoenberg is dead, instead uses the row as kind of an Ur theme. He pulls out different subsets of it and puts them together, he combines them, he adds them, he subtracts them, he does all of this really complex mathematical procedure. So you never really hear the row. It's rare that you hear a complete tone row in one of Boulez's works. And additionally, he's fond of writing some parts of his music that are totally different or derived from a completely different row than the rest of the music. He was after all these endless refractions and recombinations of one Ur theme, then manipulating that theme backwards and upside down in all the ways that Schoenberg would have done it. The question remains, why was Boulez attracted to writing such complex music in the first place? And my pet theory is because it was how his brain was wired. He was gifted with great mathematical ability and an even more fantastic ear. It was said that if you were in an orchestra that was under Boulez's direction, and even if you were a backstand violist or second violinist, if you were a little bit late, a little bit early, or a little bit out of tune, he would hear that and he would correct you. Thus, the complexity of serialism, at least to the extent to which he himself employed it, was probably something that he could use as a mathematical challenge and something that he might have been able to understand on a more intuitive level than simply your average audience goer who would just hear random notes. This great ear of his goes a long way to explaining why he, unlike many of his otherwise very strict serialist colleagues, was against the principle of octave doubling, which is a very common orchestration device. Boulez just hated octaves because he heard the different timbres that you would have to use, even if they were two of the same instrument. If they were moving in octaves, well, that's a violation of serial technique because you're using two different lines. If you hear it as two different lines instead of just a coloration or an emphasis on one line, then yes, it is. But only Boulez had the kind of ear that would hear octave doubling as two distinctly different lines. This also ties into why Boulez's orchestration is one of the most interesting of the 20th century, because in addition to having a unique understanding of what serial principle was, he had this other self-imposed limitation of he couldn't use octaves. It required more dexterity and more fancy sleight of hand when orchestrating for a traditional ensemble, but this often means that Boulez's pieces are written for unusual ensembles which got him the tone colors that he wanted without confining himself to the bounds of what you consider a traditional ensemble. The presence of the octave in Schoenberg's music, as the interval at which, for instance, a cannon might be sounded, really ground Boulez's gears, because this was, in effect, showcasing Schoenberg's desire to be part of the past. 
Despite being the literal inventor of the 12-tone technique, Boulez was so dead set against Schoenberg that he said that, uh, I want to make sure I got the quote right, so I wrote it down here, uh, went off in the wrong direction so persistently that it would be hard to find an equally mistaken perspective in the entire history of music. <laughs> Because Boulez loved complexity, it took him a long time to produce new works, and once a piece was out there in the world, he would as often as not withdraw it for revisions, and sometimes once it was withdrawn, he would never publish it again because he couldn't get it exactly right. As a result, his body of work is pretty small, and we can trace the development of his compositional thought through each and every piece because each piece is significant or influential in some way. But no piece is more notable than Le Marteau Sans Maître, The Hammer Without a Master. This song cycle to surrealist text by his favorite poet, René Char, has an odd ensemble. Contralto, alto flute, viola, guitar, vibraphone, and xylo rimba, with each of the nine movements using a different subset of these instruments. This homage to Schoenberg's landmark Piero Lunaire was not lost on listeners, who regarded it as a totally unique and exciting new sound world. Boulez utilized a serial technique known as pitch addition, where he broke up five versions of his row into different sized chunks and would recombine them to form new sets. He also used Messian's technique of a duration row by tying durations to notes for several movements, such that in certain movements whenever you heard a given pitch class, that pitch class would always be expressed using a certain duration value. In the 1960s and 1970s, Boulez was in high demand for his conducting skills, not just of his music and the music of his contemporaries, but also that of earlier 20th century rep and late romantic pieces. It was Boulez who succeeded Leonard Bernstein as music director of the New York Philharmonic, and it was Boulez who instituted a series of rug concerts where the seats would be removed and concert goers could come to the hall and lay down on blankets and pillows. It was Boulez who was tapped to conduct the 100th year anniversary performance of Wagner's Ring Cycle at the Bayreuth Festival, which drew ire and praise in equal measure for its modern stage interpretation and Boulez's unconventional approach towards tackling the score. His approach was exacting, and he left less wiggle room for individual musicians than other conductors would. He said that the way for opera to survive was to blow the opera houses up, which is a comment that has been taken significantly out of context. For Boulez, opera up through the works of, say, Alban Berg could work on the concert stage, but modern pieces needed a staging that wasn't the clunky opera house. He wanted opera to be revitalized by going to different places instead of expecting the audiences to always come to it. He pointed out that modern operas were the only theatrical medium that hadn't systematically explored venues outside the traditional venue. In the 1970s, Boulez was music director not just in New York, but also with the BBC Symphony, which significantly hampered his available composition time. While he'd taken the New York job for its prestige, it was in London where he got to program what he wanted to, as the subscription-based model put a damper on that in New York. Boulez was also tasked in the 1970s by French President Georges Pompidou to return to his home country and set up a music research laboratory. Electronic music was making headway in Britain, the United States, and elsewhere, and France lacked a center for research and development into the synthesis of electronic sound. By 1977, Boulez had set up ERCAM, the Institute for Research and Coordination in Acoustics and Music, which would emerge as a mecca for electronic musicians and those who wanted to develop synthesizing software. In particular, Urkham's research has focused on processing live sound, as commercially available synthesizers were pretty well established by the 1980s, but software that can meaningfully interact with performers and process sound instantaneously is still on the cutting edge. The innovations at Urkham dovetailed with Boulez's interest in mathematical precision. His Répond, premiered in 1981, combined live electronics with percussion soloists and a chamber orchestra in a 360-degree performance environment designed to be totally different based on where in the audience one sat. <laughs> <laughs> 
Durkheim was so important to Boulez, his legacy, and his compositional thinking that he scaled back his conducting commitments from 1977 all the way until 1992 when he resigned its directorship. Alongside the founding of Urkem was his very own Ensemble Intercontemporain, which remains one of the world's leading new music ensembles. From 1992 until early 2012, Boulez found perhaps the best balance of his career between his conducting engagements and his compositions. He wrote pieces that continued working with the live processing capabilities of Urkam technology, or pieces that were inspired by the effects he heard in electronic music. Like Edgar Varese had done earlier in the century, Boulez challenged himself to recreate electronic music using traditional analog means. Of note in this category was Sion en Cis, from the late 1990s. Based off of an earlier piano piece called simply En Cis, or Interpolations, Sio En Cis uses a trio of percussionists, harpists, and pianists spread across the stage in a dazzling display of color. Boulez died in January 2016, two months shy of his 91st birthday. His slow pace of production and myriad commitments meant that many of his projects were left unfinished at his death. Like Charles Ives much earlier in the 20th century, Boulez never considered his pieces to be totally done. He considered them continual works in progress. Sketches from the 1940s could take up to 60 years to emerge in their final form, and those were the lucky sketches. Many sketches weren't so lucky. This process of continual revision is no better expressed than in his piece Explosant Fils, which took four different tries over the course of many years to get it just right. The final version was for MIDI flute, two shadow flutes, chamber ensemble, and live electronics. And even with that final version, he only completed one third of the projected movements. Aside from his early polemic tendencies, astoundingly little is known of Boulez's private life, from his relationships to his political views. Renowned for his superhuman ear and his intensely calculating mind, his views on himself, others, and the direction of music were hard line. If you asked Boulez to name the top 10 20th century pieces, he would invariably list one of his own, which, like, fair enough, like, he was a really profoundly important composer, but that still just strikes me as a little self-aggrandizing, I don't know. His dedication to serial technique, which composers abandoned in droves from the mid-1970s onward, saw himself regress from this really bold radical to a crotchety old-timer, from someone who would boo Stravinsky for not being radical enough to someone whose only concession to his serial ideology was a late-in-life admission that perhaps you could get away with an 11 or 13 note row. Changing attitudes in music around him made him go from the avant-garde to the old guard. His conducting came about largely by necessity, and he came to believe that conducting a piece was the best way for a composer to know exactly what their work sounded like. The trouble is that these conducting commitments got in the way of his compositions. Unlike Mahler, who at least had the summers off to compose, Boulez was stuck like Bernstein, constantly conducting some ensemble in some part of the world. And he never conducted with a baton. No matter how complex the piece, he would never get a baton out. Not even a toothpick. Who Boulez got along with varied. Ligeti, who only briefly flirted with serialism and called Boulez's fascination with the system like inserting a coin into a slot machine, published the first detailed analysis of Structures 1A and dedicated the first several of his landmark piano etudes to Boulez. It was Boulez who had convinced Copland to give serialism a shot. It was Boulez who recorded some of Frank Zappa's most demanding orchestral works and mourned the iconoclastic rock star's passing. On the other hand, he thought very little of Morden Feldman, whom he found amateurish, openly despised the works of Janis Zanakis, and came to dislike Stockhausen, saying that the German was enclosed in himself and a hippie. Cage, on the other hand, was just a performing monkey. Cage responded by mocking Boulez's insistence on serial procedure, implying that Boulez's answer to any of life's most deep and pertinent and probing questions was just the number 12. He ruptured his friendship with his one-time mentor Messiaen by saying that his Toronga Lila symphony made him vomit. Over the years, Boulez mellowed, saying by the 1990s that all music had a right to exist, a far cry from what ruckus he was causing back in the 1950s. He came around to liking such relative traditionalists as Gustav Mahler and Alban Berg. In the 2000s, he admitted 
obliquely that Cage was right. He never mentioned Cage, but he said that he had just gotten tired of counting to 12. He was an enthusiast of world music, saying that African and Balinese musics provided a different sense of time than what one would find in the West. This is probably why Messiaen thought that Boulez was his successor in this domain. It's this appraisal of time perception that I find to be the fundamental through line through all of Boulez's many different pieces. He's always playing with time to some extent or another. From the Notation for Solo Piano, written in 1945, we see an approach to meter not unlike Messiaen. There are no time signatures here, and each measure differs wildly in how many notes they contain. This has its origins in the non-retrogradable rhythms of Messiaen, but in Boulez, there's a new approach, one of intentional chaos, of organized disorder. Western music had taken for granted the idea of an underlying meter or pulse for untold generations. And so Boulez and Messiaen, as well as Cage and Stockhausen and Henry Cowell, were all fascinated to one extent or another with messing with this perception and flow of time. Everybody was trying to do something with this because it was this fertile ground that had not been messed with yet. In 1991's Antime E for solo violin, the duration of the notes are linked to their dynamics, but left up to the performer to realize. Boulez's legacy has largely been left to the recorded sound. It's fortunate for us that he authorized definitive recordings of his complete works before his death. Because in order to get a Boulez performance out there, you need a dedicated ensemble. This is why the Ensemble Intercontemporain exists. You need musicians of the highest caliber who also want to perform that type of music, and you need to cultivate an interested audience for it. For all his writings and polemical opinions, he rarely touched upon the details of his compositional process, perhaps out of a fear that he'd give away his secret. And his music, admittedly, continues to divide listeners. If you don't like it, then for you, Boulez is just a serialist whose arcane procedures don't amount to fundamentally enjoyable music. But if you do enjoy it, then you see his music as a unique and genuinely expressive brand of serialism, uncompromising as it and he might have been.